I want to welcome everyone and just really thank you for being part of the queue for uh, our fourth quarter College, College of Arts and Sciences Colloquium of the 2020 Colloquia series. And this presentation today is entitled Motivating Online Learners Going the Extra Mile. I'd like to welcome our presenter, Dr. Francis Suros, an associate faculty member at Ashford who resides in Fayetteville, North Carolina, home to Fort Bragg, and was raised as an Air Force brat. She's very proud of that. Dr. Suros uh, received her Doctor of Philosophy in Education Psychology from Compella University in Minnesota. Minneapolis, Minnesota, where actually I'm from. So that's really awesome. Doctor uh, of Business Administration from Walden University online and a postdoctorate re-specialization certificate in social psychology and post-secondary education at Walden University. Dr. Francis possesses civil service experience working for the federal government to include the VA, SSA, USDA, and the Department uh, of the Air Force. She is also a former Naval Reservist. She has taught face-to-face -face at the high school level, college level, and at Mount Olive College in Mount Olive, North Carolina, and online at Ashford University and the University of the Iraqis for the last eight years. She has homeschooled her children for the past 10 years and has savored every minute of it. Bless you. She has served as a dissertation chair and committee member for students who are pursuing their PhDs. She loves both teaching and the field of psychology and in fact, has collaborated with 11 authors and wrote and published an online learning book for educators and learners, and she'll be sharing more about that today. In her free time, she's an avid athlete and spends a vast amount of time long distance running and cycling. Dr. Soros's presentation today will focus on the importance of motivating online learners Online learning has grown at, at an exceptional rate over the course of the past two decades. In addition, the COVID-19 pandemic has had a huge impact on online learning, therefore increasing the demand for online instructors to understand the importance of motivating online learners. You may post questions in the chat and we will use them to facilitate a Q&A session with Dr. Soros at the end of her presentation. Also, please keep an eye on the chat toward the end of the presentation for a link to an important follow-up survey as we appreciate your feedback. And now, Dr. Francis Soros. Okay, so um, I... The next slide here, um, we'll move along. Yeah, okay, there we go, you got it. Oh, I have that capability, wow, thank you. So thank you, Paul, for that wonderful introduction. I really appreciate that. Uh, and as he stated, online learning has grown at a really rapid rate since 2000. Um, and the COVID has also had a recent impact. So it's, it's really important to understand how to motivate learners in the online learning environment. Um, next slide, please. Let's see. I wanna start off talking about um, the concepts and principles of motivation and engagement theory. I feel that they're really important. Um, this understanding is useful in this, this forum. Um, and, and as you know, motivate a lot of you that is that motivation theory hinges on goal setting, self-regulation of goal setting, goal content, goal striving, goal structure, and goal pursuit. Wow, that's a lot of goals, isn't it? 
It's important that goals must be considered desirable and integrated with existing goals. Obviously, learners have to um, assimilate these in their own life in, um, in order for them to be reachable, um, especially learners who are contending with families and um, work responsibilities. Coming to school you know, online requires a lot of self-discipline and um, as well as the instructor that I will go along with that as well. Goal content uh, requires um, providing actual choices and de desirability of the goal. So um, if possible, um, provide options for your learners that way when they commit to something and it's their option, success typically will ensue and the research has shown that. Um, also, research has shown that near versus far psychological distance performance of a future task from a third person perspectives and importance of performing good increased when employing a third person perspective. Uh, the next slide will indicate um, that goal structure involves determinant factors and goal content is associated with supporting and establishing and implementing goals successfully. In fact, Ryan Attell insisted that goals involving autonomy, social integration, and competence led to credibility, deep cognitive processing of information, as well as a po positive coping with failure. This allows for intrinsic goal pursuit as a result of positive self-regard, which can be facilitated by educators. And moreover, the research has indicated when learners can experience a fun and a content, uh, joyful academic setting, they possess a sense of well-being, which is independent from um, academic performance, but also typically will result in a positive outcome. Uh, many educators believe it is the responsibility of the online learner to self-motivate and self-regulate. Um, <clears throat> however, Savinki and Mikichi, who now today possess a combined 100 years of post-secondary or college teaching and experience. So obviously they, they, like to they like to share their experiences and uh, I refer to them quite frequently as you will see. Um, they insist that we as online educators need to motivate our learners. So I, I take that role seriously and have personally implemented that philosophy into my courses throughout the, my experience teaching at Ashford University and it has, um, I've seen positive results. Educators should provide a continual rich and exciting learning environment using various tools. And my personal toolbox is as follows. Videos. Every week, um, I personally you know, inculcate in the announcements, uh, um, I feel a vital short brief video because this tool assists learning uh, learners in obtaining meaningful knowledge, as well as applying that material to real life examples and situations, which obviously is salient and for effective and meaningful learning. Graphics, they are very important as well. Um, the research has also shown that graphics can assist learnings with obtaining a more profound level of understanding of the in, uh, information being um, conveyed to them. That This has also been very helpful in courses such as research methods, um, because it can get quite confusing because um, you want them to have a very good long-term memory store so they can recall this information when out there, you know, in real life works in personal life situations. Course cafe involvement, the, the, the social psychology research was overwhelming and it showed that um, individuals want to feel a sense of belonging and being active in the course cafe certainly is an opportunity for um, instructors to you know, initiate some type of personal banter. And I personally employ this every time I teach a class. And it's, it's amazing because the goal is to have the students you know, discuss non-academic or class-related personal life experiences with each other and to grow from that. The next uh, uh, portion on my toolbox is send personal emails. I do this every week. I even include motivational videos 
um, and they have uh, resulted in banter between my learners and I. They really like that. It also conveys to the learner that the educator actually genuinely cares about them and their education, as well as demonstrates altruism. Um, I also post entertaining announcements such as Happy Labor Day, Happy Columbus Day, etc. These have also, uh, you know, been successful for me in my experience at Ashford. Uh, maintain a constant presence in the course room is very, very important. Um, I personally try to get into my class every day. Um, I realize there are times when, um, whether it's technical difficulties, meaning internet or devices, we cannot, or time and family obligations, we can't always get in there every day. Uh, I try to, because again, um, this shows and demonstrates to learners that you care. Um, we need to make sure that the um, feedback that we provide to our learners is also expedient as well as grad grammatically correct in order for them, the learners, to make the necessary and applicable adjustments in their discussion posts, their peer responses, as well as their assignments in a timely manner. So as soon as we can get that information back to them, they can get back to work applying what we convey to them immediately. Next slide. Um, we also want to create a learning environment that is similar to base to base because um, I realized that in the last nine years and even in my own personal online experiences, we feel a bit isolated um, and that and this creating a face to face environment sense can all can really unequivocally make a huge difference in our um, course rooms online. So I wanted to stress that to you as well as employing an enthusiastic based attitude. Um, there are times when I see things that I know that they can be a little concerning. I never um, say anything negative in any of my discussions or in my feedback. I'm always positive. I even say to the worst possible um, assignment that I've seen that I commend you for your effort because that may well be that individual's best. Next slide, please. Um, I try to respond as many learners as possible in the online discussion threads. I realize this can be quite challenging, but um, it, you know, again, I'm trying to make and portray somewhat of a face to face feel in an online um, environment, which I realize is constant versus face to face. Uh, at the end of the class, you, you get to leave and go home and you don't, you know, see or speak again about any information or, you know, anything's anything upcoming or assignments or what have your feedback until you meet again with the, an online learning environment. We know it's constant. It's 24 seven until the class ends. And sometimes uh, we are faced with obligations even long after. And I'm aware of that. Um, learners yearn to feel a sense of belonging. In fact, Savinke Mikichi posited that responding to the individual learner may be one of the most effective ways to improve instruction. And that's why I make that so significant, meaning creating such a face-to-face uh, -face feel. Um, we need to also uh, consider learner diversity because cultural culture, it uh, comprises many layers. Um, and, and we must admit the online classroom or course room comprises a very diverse group of individuals. This is why it's, it's crucial for educators to understand the layers of culture. And I wanna say that um, it's been defined as an individual's chosen pattern for learning. Again, Savinki and Mikichi declared that responding to the individual learners is one of the most significant method for improving instruction. The other um, concept I want to um, share with you is the triadic theory of intelligence, which emphasizes three factors, analytical, creative, and practical. The research again has shown and supported this theory with measures indicating accuracy with measuring learner performance. Okay, so when we're object, we want to be objective when we're assessing our learners and it's it's very important to consider these layers of culture when we assess our learners. Therefore, I, I really encourage us as educators to employ this sensitivity when evaluating and, assess, and assessing learners uh, written assignments. I do wanna share an example that um, while um, teaching a course 
um, here at Ashford. I had and I have contended with learners that their primary language is Spanish. So imagining myself trying to uh, write a, a document in Spanish and having to translate English to Spanish and vice versa, that can be quite complicated for the learner. So we, culture and, and considering it is very important. Um, and then lastly, I'm gonna go over effectively utilizing course surveys. Um, this is a w very good strategy for educators to improve the online learning uh, environment. Um, specifically, you can implement course-based fe feedback into your course. It's an opportunity to utilize this feedback to make changes that specifically apply to the course, including learning materials. And then, of course, implementing specific instructor feedback. Well, this is an effective tool for educators to form, perform self-reflection and potentially make changes to their online instructional methods. I have, of course, used this as well. And then the last uh, two are, um, let's see. The last slide, I believe here, sorry, is implementing specific curriculum-based feedback, referring to student course surveys as a tool to make changes in curriculum can assist learners in obtaining meaningful knowledge. Okay, I had the opportunity at Ashford to get involved in a course modification and my learners at that time were experiencing difficulty with an assigned text. I seized this opportunity, made the changes to um, some of the um, assignments as well as the course text. And as a result, the learners were very satisfied. So obviously again, a very useful tool for the course and for the educator. And that is it. I, I um, want to um, end by stating this happens to be an excerpt from a book that I, as um, Mr. Schultz indicated, collaborated with 11 uh, professors, very diverse group. Um, and this chapter is, like I said, an excerpt. If anyone is interested in this book, please send me an email and I will personally send it to you at no cost. There are several other chapters. Basically, the first half of the book is um, guidance for online instructors. The second half of the book is for um, guiding online learners. Um, I'm in the process uh, presently republishing it because I want it to be at no cost to anybody. So I have no problem sharing this book. I think that um, it can help anyone, anyone interested, please, again, just send me an email. Well, I, I want to thank you, Francis, for that presentation. And I, I want to open it up in the chat uh, for those who would like to ask more questions and for us to really keep this dialogue going. It's fine. Oh, you're absolutely welcome. This was, I actually wrote this book with the other professors, I want to say five or six years ago. And I, I, I embraced the experiences that I had every term with my learners and the staff at Ashford. And I seize that as an opportunity to assist other learners and educators. Here's a great question. Can yes. you speak? Yeah, can you speak to how you effectively manage your time while providing this level of engagement with your students? Because I, I, I'm gonna be honest, I'm a, I'm a very disciplined individual, but I found, I honestly used my online learning experience, which is why I am very adamant that online educators must themselves have experience online learning before, I think that's requisite because you can relate to the situation. Like I said, Fiskatel 2010, they admonished that 
when you can empathize with the learner, then it'll make, you know, obviously positive results. So for me, I had honestly developed a very root, I'm going to be honest with you, a very strict routine in my life with time management. And I allocated time and I do now every day. If I can't, I get upset at myself and be honest with you, but I can't get in that course room every day. So I, I, I feel that it's important and I will make time, even if it's late in the day for my learners to keep that engagement going. Because the research has shown that when learners are engaged in the material, and this is where online beats face-to-face, -face, they're going to learn a lot more. And that's the goal here. Yes, ma'am, prior prioritizing your day is very much a key. So when I get up in the morning, I, I tend to get up and go online after I've done other, obviously, important um, chores, I want to say, in my life. I run my own business. So, you know, it's a, it's a matter of prioritizing your day. And this is very much a priority for me, but also knowing the importance of being present in the course room, making myself available. I also make myself available via text messaging too. I missed that question. I wanted to, see, I, I do make myself available text messaging in case, because I don't have my computer on all the time. I don't go in my emails every second of the day. So I do make myself available. Some learners will utilize that, but I wanna say the majority of them won't. Only a small percentage. And in fact, in saying that, I, I hate to tell you, the research has shown that a small percentage of learners are actually here to learn. That's why I make it a priority to motivate and inspire. Another great question, Dr. Saros, is uh, do, you use, do you use video or audio responses in your weekly discussions? No, I do not. I do not use those. I just uh, make comments, but that's, I have added, that's why I put the videos in under the announcements, but I have added a long time ago videos in uh, you know, and that's a good idea, you know, especially now that the, the, the actual forum had online for our course room has changed and it's a long continuous feed. They will see that. Whereas before it was separated by learners, they wouldn't have seen that. So that makes sense. And I have no issues. And I think that's a great recommendation, but I do usually typically put those in the um, announcement section and I have emailed some videos. Because then I, I find that students are, are going to respond or see it quicker in an email than they are going to see it in the course room because they're not always all going on into going into the course room every single day. But I've noticed they typically will respond to an email a lot faster. That being said, when I evaluate all my learners assignments, I make sure that I click that for them to be returned as well as they get an email. I make sure that I check off for them to get an email and that has rewarded them and myself that that is a positive thing. We're, we're getting more fast communication through that method. Great. Uh, Verlinda yes, has a question. You. No you see that? Yeah. I noticed that you said that your feedback had no negatives. Can you elaborate on what this means as far as grading, please. Do that's you why, mean that's, that? Okay, yeah, because they, yeah. The, thing, the thing is, is that people do not, I know a lot about human behavior, which gives me this ingenious idea for me to, okay, like I stated, I have seen some hideous writing. I, I'm not gonna lie to you. But the thing is, is I still state at the beginning, every time, no matter what I see, when it's only satisfactory and less, what I say is I commend you for your effort. And then I, then I will say, however, please ensure to address all of the assignment or discussion elements so that meaningful knowledge can be obtained, maximum knowledge if that, from what we're trying to accomplish with this discussion or assignment, as well as points not because I don't want to use the points as a method to 
like a, a source of them to complete the assignment because the goal here is for them to obtain meaning, meaningful and useful information for them to recall later, especially when it's in long-term memory store. And I'm saying that because I know that being an educational psychologist. So then I will go on and I'll say, however, you know, and then I will explain what is missing and the importance of it as briefly as possible, because I have found that if you have too much feedback, they're not gonna read it, they're just gonna <laughs> disregard it. And then at week six, if you're teaching a master level course, you will find that with some, if not most learners, you're saying the same thing at week six that you are pointing out to them at week one. For instance, please know that, you know, direct citations require page or paragraph number, for example, to adhere to APA stand writing standards, right? Here's an example. And then here we are week five and we're still seeing, you know, very um, discombobulated looking citations or for as far as formatting or them not still addressing all of the important aspects of an assignment or discussion. So then that's when, you know, you have to sometimes and they're going to start asking because they're going to want to increase their grade. And that just happened to me, as a matter of fact, this morning, and I encourage them go back re modify your assignment and I don't have a problem. I I'm going to be honest with you. I don't have a problem regrading it. And that's what I encourage the learner to do this morning. So <clears throat> there's the key. So, and then I also finally with these writers that are having difficulty writing, whether it's too much citing, which we know we see a lot of well in excess of 20% all the time. I just, I go through that all the time and I, I, I humble myself and I share with them sometimes because they get embarrassed that happened to me when I was in, and it's a wake up call. You can only cite 20%. I'm sorry, that is the rule. I, I, I go back and fix it. I give them a copy of the report, giving them plenty of opportunity to modify and gain more knowledge from this experience so that this, they don't run into this later on down the line. And they're gonna refine and polish their writing abilities. I also remind them that the writing center is available, that you have live tutors. I say this, all the time that's and but I, I i do it in a very positive way that i commend them for trying however let's go over here and see what the right because i'm not a writing expert i'm a subject matter expert and i tell them that i've had to work on my own write, writing abilities i'm not ashamed to admit that i'm a learner too we have to humble ourselves we don't know everything and manifesting mutual respect has definitely paid off yep and Verlinda agrees with you and has seen the uh, opportunity to help students improve. So, yeah. Yes, because I, I, I have learners that have recently expressed, you know, okay, I'm not doing this correctly. Um, I can't find, okay, I couldn't find Turnitin. And I'm like, well, the, it, it's it, my screen's not exactly the same as yours. If you cannot find Turnitin, I see it under, I do see it under course resources in my, on my end. If you can't locate something, she was even um, mentioning the live tutors. They, they, they can't guide her to turn it in. And I said, well, call tech support because you may have a Mac. I might have a, a PC. I don't know. Somebody could be using an iPad. Devices vary. And I'm sorry to be referring you to tech support, but I am not a technology individual as you have seen today we've had some issues i do the best that i can <laughs> i know where i know where to draw the line and i admit you're an expert in it i'm here to learn too awesome great stuff any more questions i know dr Sirs is passionate about this and uh i we this is Really helpful information, uh, especially timely for this time to uh, really engage with our students. And, you know, maybe you could speak to the, um, the importance of, uh, you know, creating that community in the classroom because of ISO, uh, the social isolation why that's important. Well, and, and that that's why you know i'm in the process i'm not you know we have a lot of research and i hate to bring this up and it, but we have a lot of research that's more geared towards the college level in an online learning environment and now 
we have K through 12, K, let's say K, well, definitely K through 12, but I have seen research studies in which high schoolers have already been using online learning. So it's really important, you know, because we're all faced with what's going on today, thereby changing, it's changing the online learning environment to more of a virtual line learning environment. So I think that um, it's important to, besides, you know, make, making yourself available, you got to be approachable too. Um, I, I'm going to share with you from a lot of students that it's all in my, you know, um, surveys or all in my online banter with my learners. They honestly feel that, you know, a very big disconnect. So how can we, you know, between us and them, how can we make it where it's not so separated more of, and I realize we're talking asynchronous, synchronous learning environment. How can we make it feel more harmonious? And that is what I do my, I do the best that I can every single class making each learner feel important, um, trying to respond to all of them and continuously like going into the classroom, even at times after the class is finished, because learners are going to go back and still look at that information. So, you know, there are even times that I've seen an error and I've gone back and corrected it my, for, for myself, you know, again, admitting that we are learners too, we're approachable and understanding how this environment works is the best way to um, be a more, I wanna say effective instructor in this environment. So, you know, again, putting yourself in that learner's position, being, being available. And I know that's hard with everything going on and today, especially, but it's important that we continue. Here's the most important thing I'm gonna say. If we are a very good role model, guys, they're gonna follow us because I have learners telling me still to this day, they've gone on and been instructors and I'm the instructor, they're duplicating. That speaks volumes. And that's yeah. what I'm saying. You, you have to be a very positive role model because that modeling itself, and Savinki, I think she's the one that has most of the uh, teaching experience here. That is crucial. Yeah. So, and that's well, why I, so I model yeah. after them and I, and I want other educators to model after me. Cause if you're just setting that positive role example for them to emulate that right there is enough more than just discussions, assignment feedback, you, you have to manifest it as the educator. What, yeah. how would you, if you're taking a class, how do you, what do you expect at the front of that room? As, as an athlete, I want to see a nice looking individual up there as far as the body's concerned, because if they're not, uh, I'm going to be concerned about the outcome for me. See, learners think like that too. How is this individual, if, if are they going to listen to me? Are they going to be receptive? I know this, I know guys that it's prolific, the excuses the requests for extensions are every time that the week ends, but they are work. They we're in a pandemic. They have children, a lot of them. They are work lives, medical issues. There's a lot of, you know, let's face it. 70% of Americans are overweight, obese, or have health issues. Uh, the number one killer America is heart disease. Number two is type two diabetes. We have a lot of unhealthiness combined with these other issues, working, family, pursuing a higher education. And I tell all my learners in their introductions that I, the first thing I commend them for is coming in and, and pursuing higher education to make them a better individual or open up doors of opportunity for themselves. So role modeling well, very, is salient. Yep, yeah, no, that's a great, and that's a great place for us to wrap up today and, we want to thank you, Dr. Soros, uh, for a very timely presentation. Uh, and to everyone attending uh, the October 20th colloquium, uh, please complete 
the follow-up survey. Uh, give us your feedback. It's been posted in the chat. Um, the survey will also be available with the recording of this presentation on the AU CETL colloquium page and emailed to you directly. So if you've attended today, you'll be receiving that. Also, please stay tuned to your email inboxes, the CETL website and the CETL social media for details about our next CAS colloquium on November 10th, presented by Dr. Catherine Sellers, an associate faculty member for Ashford University on the subject of an action plan for faculty self wellness. We've got to keep ourselves well. Please come to that one. That's going to be really good. And so stay healthy and happy and engaged in your classroom and enjoy the rest of the day. And again, Dr. Saros, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. This was a wonderful opportunity. Thank you guys.